Hey y'all, Mr. Gibson here with our next lesson in cryptography. And in this lesson, we're going to be moving into our unit on polyalphabetic ciphers. So learning how to use different keys, besides just the singular set of keys we've been using in our monoalphabetic ciphers, to generate ciphertext with a, a little bit harder time for people to analyze and decrypt. So let's move into it. The, the primary tool that we're going to be using in all of our polygraphic ciphers is known as a tabular recta. And the tabular recta is basically just a square table um, with a bunch of different alphabets in it, all English, but they're kind of offset from each other from one row to the next. Uh, this term was invented by a German author, uh, a monk, Johannes Trithemius, and we'll see that one of the ciphers we're going to cover is named after Johannes. Um, and he was alive in 14, 1500s or so, and, and I guess that's a nice uh, picture of him there on the right. Um, one interesting fact I discovered when researching uh, Johannes is that his most famous piece of work was actually on like the banned book, book list for the Catholic Church, which he was a monk for, uh, from 1609 all the way up to 1900. Uh, and I guess the reason why is when you look at that book, it looks like it's about magic and kind of, I guess that was something not tolerated by the church at that time. Uh, specifically talking about how to use spirits to communicate over long distances, but it actually turns out that um, that book was encrypted. So it uses what's called a cover text, uh, which is more of a steganaf steganographic tool to disguise not like the meaning that we use with ciphers, but to actually hide it in an existing message. So uh, my guess would be is the magic text is a cover text for the true message, which is actually all about cryptography and steganography. Um, so there's three volumes of that. They've all been decrypted, and they're really all about just kind of code making and code breaking. And uh, I suspect that when that true true uh, message was revealed is, is when it finally was able to come off the banned book list there from the church. So, all right, let's learn how to use it. Um, so let's let's start with enciphering a message. Um, so we can see there's the tabula recta there on the right. We've got um, rows and columns. Um, we have kind of the top row, A through Z. All of those letters are going to be representative of our plain text. And then we've got the first column, A through Z, which are going to represent our keyword letters. And we're going to find the intersection of row and column in the middle. And so all you know, 26 by 26 letters there in the middle all representing our ciphertext. So we start out by creating what's known as a running key. So because our key is not going to be fixed, it's going to be changing depending on which character that we're trying to encipher. We'll need some sort of pattern or way to generate um, not a single key, but a collection of keys in order. And we call that collection of keys the running key because uh, we can run out that pattern as long as we need to. This one ran all the way out to A to Z. We probably didn't need that many if all we're going to encrypt is the message, my secret. So we'll just trim that back um, so it ends at the letter H. So now we've got, uh, well, how many we got there? Uh, eight letters in our running key to match up with the eight letters in our plain text. And now let's actually use this. So we're gonna select the first row there, or sorry, first column there in our letters, in our message. Um, and we're gonna make sure that the running key is perfectly aligned over our plain text. So we'll take the key A in the plain text of M and then we're going to find the row that matches the keyword. So we're going to look up that first column there, find A, and that's the row we're going to highlight. And then we're going to go look for the column with the plain text letter M and highlight that. And where the row and column we've highlighted intersect, that is going to be our ciphertext letter. So in this case, that'll be the letter M. A mathematical way to think about that is if we convert, convert both the plain text and the running key from letters to their corresponding integers, add them, mod by 26, we can calculate the, the ciphertext letter that way as well. That might sound a little bit familiar. That sounds a lot like Caesar shift, right? We take our plain text, convert to a number, we add the key to it, mod by 26. So in fact, that, that's true. All of our tabular recta based ciphers that we'll study in this unit are all based off of Caesar. They're just kind of a modification of the Caesar cipher, which was one of our simpler ciphers. But we're going to see these modifications of rotating keys are going to make this really a lot more powerful. So, okay, our first letter in the ciphertext is M. Let's move to the next pairing of letters. So we're going to take a B from the key and a Y from the plain text, highlight those rows and columns, and find the intersection of Z. So again, we could do this mathematically. We take the plain text Y, the, cipher, uh, the, the running key B, convert them both the numbers, add them, mod by 26, we get 25, which is equivalent to Z. And we can start following this pattern a little bit quicker now. So... S and C intersect at U. 
and we can keep moving our way down the line. So then D and E intersect at H, E and C intersect at G, F and R intersect at W, G and E intersect at K, and H and T intersect at the letter A. So we've got our ciphertext message. Let's look at deciphering a message. So we'll take our ciphertext here. Uh, we've got our ciphertext of H, A, X, K, O, S, W, I. I made a little bit simpler running key here. So instead of um, rotating through the entire alphabet, we just have kind of two letters that it alternates back and forth from. So this is just a different way to set up a running key. Um, and we're going to do the exact same process, except we're going to have to go in a slightly different order. When we take that first pairing of letters, just like before, we're going to use the key to help figure out which column, uh, sorry, which row to highlight. And then we're, now we're going to look for the ciphertext letter in that row, H, that matches. And then we're going to follow that column up to figure out the plain text letter that corresponds to it, which is E. So again, the same letters correspond to the same things in the tabula recta, but without the order that we're kind of highlighting things in is going to change. Before it was highlight the row, highlight the column, and then look for the intersection. Now it's going to be highlight the row, find where the intersection occurred, and then follow the column back up to where we started with. Mathematically, that's the same thing as taking your ciphertext letter in your running key, converting to integers, and then subtracting. So maybe that's no surprise if the encryption process for tabula recta was similar to the Caesar cipher, the decryption process should be similar as well. And lo and behold, it is. So when we decrypt Caesar, we take the ciphertext letter and we subtract off the key. Well, that's exactly what we're doing here. So we'll move through again. K and A, we highlight the row, we find where the intersection occurred, we follow the column back up, and we get a Q. Mathematically, that's as if we took A and K, converted to 0 and 10. We did 0 minus 10 to get negative 10. Negative 10 mod 26 is 16, and that is equivalent to a Q. So again, we can move a little bit quicker here to kind of get our last few letters. So if we look at the row D, find the intersection of the ciphertext letter X, and follow it up, we get a U. Next pairing of letters, we get an A. Next pairing of letters, we get an L and we get the word equal. Looks like I cut it short there because I was getting tired of all those letters. And that's how we use a tabula recta. So we can see there's a lot of parallels to the Caesar cipher that we've already been studying. And we have this nice visual tool here that helps us make these calculations a little bit quicker. And I think that's the history behind that table is that we were, you're able to use that table without having any knowledge of arithmetic or modular arithmetic which back when this was really becoming popular in the 1500s, not a lot of people had access to knowing how to do arithmetic, let alone modular arithmetic, but they can follow rows and columns in a table pretty quickly and still gives them some pretty powerful ways to encrypt messages. So we're, what we're going to look at for the rest of this unit are the different ways to set up those running keys. We're going to see some are more secure than others, so that when you encrypt your message using the tabula recta, you know how secure that encryption process was. Thanks for watching. We'll catch you on the next one.